The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. And we're hoping that everyone is enjoying a safe and happy Martin Luther King Day. I am so excited to be here with you this morning because we have an amazing guest who's going to be joining us. I do want to say that we are pre-recording this interview on the Friday before because it, because it is Martin Luther King Day. And so the staff is taking the day off. Um, but we wanted to bring you a very special guest today. So uh, author and advocate Thomas McKeon is going to be joining us in just a few minutes. This is his very first time being on the show, which I don't even understand how that could be a thing. Um, but I know that you're all, I'm going to enjoy having an opportunity to talk with him. And I think that you guys are too. I just wanted to take one second uh, in commemoration of this day. I find myself a little emotional about it. But um, it, I realized last night when I was thinking about this, that I was a kindergartner. I was in kindergarten um, when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and I it affected me deeply um, because he was already a person in my life as a kindergartner that I looked up to and saw as this public person. And he, see, seeing him speak on television was one of the earliest memories that I have. And, and hearing him, it's so interesting. I think we discount sometimes how speaking... Um, and, and putting things into existence in a child's mind, how much it can affect their path. But I can remember being four years old and listening to him speak and thinking that, of course, that was the path that we were going on and that, um, and that all people were equal and that I, you know, would be standing in my life shoulder to shoulder with people of all different hues of all different races, of all different religions, and that that we would stand shoulder to shoulder. And that was in my awareness. And then, of course, um, you know, to, to hear that he had been assassinated. And I don't think that assassination is a typical word that a kindergartner understands. But those of us who were born in the year that I was born in, we all understood it because that was also the year that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated too. And you couldn't not, you couldn't get away from it. Um, so it was very much a, a part of our kindergarten year that we experienced that. So I, uh, this is a, a commemorative holiday that I appreciate greatly because it's a, for a figure who large, uh, loomed large in in my life and in my upbringing and and how I view the world. So um, thrilled to be able to be here today and commemorate it with all of you. Now I mentioned that this show is pre-recorded, but that doesn't mean that you can't interact with us. You still, uh, whenever we do the pre-recorded live shows, now I try to drop in and monitor if you guys have questions. And obviously, if you have questions for our guest, you can absolutely be writing those in, and we will make sure that he gets all of those. And I hope that he's going to be willing to come back another time when we are live, live, live with you guys. Um, so keep in mind that there are lots of different ways that you can interact. You can interact right now on Facebook on YouTube. YouTube. I'll be able to monitor those in real time uh, on the actual day. And you can also send us comments to, uh, you can do it on our homepage, autism-live.com. There's a place where you can put in a comment at the bottom that costs you nothing. It's completely anonymous. Or you can email me directly at shannon at autism-live.com. We always love to hear from you. Uh, you know, our whole mission here at Autism Live is that we want to provide information and inspiration to that large your autism community starts with people who are on the autism spectrum, of course, but we also include in that, in that community, everyone who loves those individuals. We believe that if not now, eventually that will be and should be the entire world. Uh, and we just want to be allies towards that happening. So uh, I mentioned that we've got this amazing guest. Let me tell you my disclaimer that we have lots of experts that are here on the show, uh, including the one that we have today, but please don't count me in that category. I am a former teacher, so that means always a teacher. Once a teacher, always a teacher. I am uh, a former stand-up comedian. 
and once a former comedian, always a comedian. Uh, but more importantly, I, we asked this the other day about what five words do you use to describe yourself? And the number one word I use to describe myself is mom. I am a mom of an amazing young man who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half and is now a very successful college student with absolutely no supports. I could not be prouder of him and more excited about the things that we've learned on this journey and are still learning. And that's why I sit here is because I want to help you to get to the things that will get you where you're trying to go to, whoever you are and wherever you're trying to go to, because it's not one size fits all, right? So I hope you'll join us here, but just just don't mistake me for an expert. Mistake me for somebody who is really passionate about this community and about making sure that individuals on the spectrum are treated with respect and given the rights and opportunities that they so richly deserve and not be discriminated against, right? So in any case, uh, that's the disclaimer out of the way. Uh, we do like to start, even on Mondays, even when it's a holiday, we like to start off the show with our little warm up, uh, what we call our jargon of the day. When we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, we try to first give you the actual definition. Often we will make fun of the actual definition because it's useless, because it's written by people who, you know, are, are have so many letters after their name and are not concerned about you and I understanding what they're talking about. So it's not that the definition is silly, it's that it cannot be understood because it has so much more jargon in it. So then we, so we'll make fun of that. And then when we can, and then we give you a working definition to try to give us a place where we can begin to understand. Now it's 2022. We've been doing the show for over 10 years. We regularly cycle back through jargon terms, but every once in a while where there's a real big push for us to do new jar jargon terms. And uh, we uncovered a bunch of terms that we use on the show from time to time that we just had never taken the time to do jargon of the day with. So today is one of those terms. Uh, easily confusing, uh, but let's see if we can shed a little light on it. Uh, so today's jargon term is hyper sensitivity. And I, and I pronounce that the way I did because later in the week, we'll talk about hypo sensitivity and they are vastly different, uh, antithetical maybe even. So hypersensitivity. So let's take a look at what, uh, first of all, you know, I think we all have, we go, we've heard this, we've heard of hypersensitivity. Um, and we probably come to this with uh, a preconception of what it might be. Let's check and see if our preconception is correct. So let's take a look at our actual definition first. Hypersensitivity is excessive, often painful reaction to everyday auditory, visual, or tactile stimuli, such as bright lights or loud noises. And I, I really, I'm not going to make fun of this definition because I like several things about it. Um, I understand that it is a gray, squishy term to say excessive because what's excessive to me may not be excessive to you, right? Um, but, but it puts, it says that this can't be something that's slight, right? And in fact, it clarifies that it, this has the potential to be a painful reaction to an everyday stimuli, um, stimulus. So um, I really don't think that anybody could read that and poo-poo it. Right. And, and, and that's what I liked most about this definition, because when you are hypersensitive to something, it is not something that people should just be telling you to get over. I think that's what I what I really liked about this. So let's with that understanding that this is, you know, the professional definition of what it is. Let's take a look at our working definition of it and see if we can begin to um, really delve in and, and have a, an appreciation for this. Um, being Becoming overwhelmed by sensory input that is perceived by others as tolerable. Now, you know, this, this is where we get into what is tolerable to you and what is tolerable to another person. But you know, I think that we can all understand that um, in most buildings nowadays, uh, there is some level of fluorescent uh, lighting uh, or uh, LED lighting, right? And what we've come to understand is that some people are very hypersensitive to the vibration of that type of light, that it is so dis disabling to them that it makes them dizzy or it makes them not be able to focus or, uh, you know, put a thought together and, and be ver vocal or verbal. 
Um, now, there is the potential if we if we just said, well, we're just going to leave that alone and we're just going to continue putting up fluorescent lights and those people can just get over it. I mean, first of all, that would be very inhumane, right? Um, but there would be very much the potential for, for someone to not be successful in a classroom if that was the constraint that, well, we're just going to do that because... 10 of the people in the classroom aren't bothered by it and only one is, so we're just going to leave it alone. And that person just has to suck it up. Right. Um, but I think we are moving towards, and I certainly want to live in a world that is more empathetic, that, that looks as looks at individuals and says, we don't all process, um, sensory things in the same way and with the same dial. You know, I, I love, uh, what is the documentary? It's I'm losing my mind right now. Uh, Spinal Tap, the documentary where they talk about turning up the volume and uh, what do you set the, the amp volume at? And he says, you know, I put it at 11. It goes from one to 10, but he says he wants to put it at 11. It's a phrase that we use a lot in our house because I certainly am hypersensitive to some stimuli because I think everybody's hypersensitive to something um, to the point where it's uncomfortable. The thing about it is, is though we see some people who have categories of things that they'll be hypersensitive to and that it isn't just a little painful, it's a lot painful. I think about um, someone like Dr. Stephen Shore, who's a brilliant mind um, and a brilliant educator and has been teaching at Adelphi University for decades. And he is someone who wears a baseball hat when he teaches as a professor. And however many years ago that he began teaching, he had to say to them, it was not appropriate then for a professor to wear a baseball hat, right? There are still some people now who probably go, well, that's disrespectful. But wearing that baseball hat is what allows Dr. Shore to go into his classroom and teach without having to modify the environment. It is his personal modifier that he puts up and because it has a bill, it closes out just enough stimuli that he can go about doing what he does, which I think many people would argue is genius. So if we don't make accommodations for people and their sensitivities to stimuli, what are we saying no to? Who are we saying no to? And how much progress are we saying no to? Um, imagine, I'm sure that all of you have some accommodation that you do for yourself before you have to do something that's difficult. Um, you know, I know people who are not on the spectrum who can't go to a concert. Um, or put earplugs in their ears when they go to a really loud concert at a venue because it's just too loud for them. I know I've left venues because it was too loud for me. Um, but I know people who will put in those orange uh, earplugs and, and go. Is that any different than someone who wears the noise-canceling headphones on a subway because it's loud? I think we're moving towards a kinder, gentler phase of our humanity where we are going to stop judging people because they are open and honest and accommodating of themselves when it comes to these kinds of issues. So why do we bring this up? I think it's important for us to normalize that it is a part of life, that people will have hypersensitivity to things and that we begin looking when we see a behavior, let's say that we see a behavior in a three-year-old who doesn't yet have the language to say that noise, I can't handle it. Right. Um, that we begin to, to have the awareness of if, if someone is having a reaction, is it possible that there are other things going on? And I think that we find with autism, often there are other things going on. And we can take a compassionate, empathetic uh, point of view that we not persist in, in expecting people to get over it. Or, or that we don't label it and go, well, that's them being disrespectful. No. No, uh, we have to be compassionate and, and allow for accommodations to accommodate these kinds of things. Now, are there therapies that work on hypersensitivity? Yes. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot on the show is systematic desensitization, but the key to systematic desensitization is going so slowly that it doesn't 
overwhelm the person or upset them. And if in fact, it gets to the point where it is disturbing that we go back to the last place that worked. If we, if we do the opposite of that, it's something called flooding. And that's literally when you throw somebody in the deep end of the pool to see if they'll swim. It is unkind. It is not something you should ever do with a child who is on the autism spectrum. And you should only do it with an adult who is consented and understands what's happening. And there are professionals there in the space to deal with the emotions that come up with it. I say that all the time on the show, but I'm going to keep saying it until I turn blue and keel over. Um, because I think that there are some people who don't understand how unkind and how traumatizing it could be to a child to, and, and it happens all the time, sometimes unintentionally, um, where a child will be flooded with something that is really sensitive for them. And then the journey back from that, because now there's the potential for PTSD, uh, you know, the journey back to being in a place where they can be calm and go through that is so much harder. Flooding is not a thing to do with any child, let alone a child who has a documented disability. So there we go. I've, I've said my piece on that. Moving on, we always have a question of the day for you. And our question this morning, we, we love it if you guys write in and tell us on Facebook or on YouTube or wherever you're watching us. Don't forget that we are a free download of a podcast wherever you get your podcast. But our question today is what overwhelms you? I, I always like to talk about, you know, ourselves first, whether you're a, a person on the spectrum or whether you're a parent of someone on the spectrum or a teacher of someone on the spectrum, um, if we're, or just someone who loves someone on the spectrum. If we think about it from our, our own point of view, I do think that we come, uh, we come to a place that's uh, more empathetic um, quicker. And let's face it, there's something that overwhelms you. There's lots of, I'm somebody who gets overwhelmed easily, uh, very easily. Uh, so if we come from that point of view, then we can understand when someone else is overwhelmed in the moment. And, you know, it's important that we don't automatically assume that what overwhelms us overwhelms the people that we love, the case, right? And what works for us. overwhelmed. But when I'm overwhelmed, is it good for people to be in my face lecturing me about why I'm overwhelmed? I would say not ever. <laughs> All right. Um, when someone is overwhelmed is not the moment to be teaching new skills. Um, I certainly don't respond to that. And I don't know, in all my years of teaching, I've never met somebody who, when they're overwhelmed is like, oh yes, teach me about why I'm overwhelmed. I've never seen that circumstance happen. Um, but they want solutions. They want help. They want support. They just don't want to be taught about what is happening in the moment. Does that make sense? Uh, but please write in and tell us what overwhelms you. If I were to go through what overwhelms me, we would be here until next Martin Luther King Day. So we're not going to do that, but let's suffice it to say I'm overwhelmed by a lot. Uh, and then let's move on to our topic for the week. Every week we have a topic. I particularly loved last week's. I don't know if I could possibly love this week's more than last week, but let's see. Our topic for this week is sensory dysregulation, which is a very important topic. Uh, this is hand in hand with what we've been talking about, that there are times when we cannot get in sync with what we want to do because there are sensory things that are preventing us from being able to get to the things that we want to do. And we've all experienced this at some point, right? What uh, Dr. Grampuche was just telling the story the other day about how she, the first time she went to Japan and she had jet lag and she got off the plane and she was discombobulated and it was the wrong time of day. And, uh, you know, and there were all these billboards and that she had to go into her hotel room and close the curtains and sit in a ball and be quiet to allow herself to unravel from all the sensory things that were going on for her. Um, you know, and, and, and I think we've all been there in, in some way and somehow, and it's, and I think a lot of times people go, oh, well, it's negative. It isn't always negative. I, my mother was a brilliant quilter and all she ever wanted to do was to go to this place where there was the be all end all quilt store.
time. And she had to travel a day's journey away to get to this quilt store. She walked in and had total sensory overload and, and stood there, froze for a minute, turned around and walked out and stood outside and shook because she couldn't handle all of the input because it was pleasant. So let's not automatically, you know, deem it something that's negative. We can, we can get sensory overload and sensory dysregulation, no matter who we are, no matter how we identify ourselves in the world, no matter where we are, pleasant or unpleasant. So these things happen and they happen to all of us. But let's, let's say that for individuals on the spectrum, it's likely for it to be potentially more often, potentially to more different types of things, potentially more painful, uh, and potentially something that prevents them from being able to do the things that they want to do. So we definitely want to be talking about this and how we can give a toolbox, again, not when it's happening, but teach people a toolbox for, have, for, for recognizing, like my mother recognized, I can't handle this. I got to go out. Uh, I can't, I can't be in here. I mean, people have passed out uh, because they didn't recognize this is too much for me. I need to step outside. Um, so we want to give everybody a toolkit for recognizing what your states are, recognizing what stimuli is difficult for you, coming up with a game plan for how do you, you know, do you get a baseball hat? Do you do systematic desensitization? Like what's the game plan? And when the game plan isn't working, what's your fallback, right? So that we can all regulate ourselves. And the truth of the matter is, is that we can teach skills even to a three-year-old who's nonverbal of how to regulate themselves. Um, so powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. Having said that, we're going to talk about that all this week, but I, I don't want to wait any longer because we have an amazing gentleman who's joining us. And if you are relatively new to the autism world, I, I still think that he will be somebody that you have heard of and, and heard of, but I can't wait for you to meet him. It's my first time meeting him. Thomas McKeon is joining us right now. And he, back in a day when and there were really only a handful, less than a handful of self-advocates who were speaking and touring the world and speaking out and saying, identifying themselves as being a person on the spectrum. I'll let him tell you the words that he uses. Uh, but obviously we've had Temple Grandin on before, um, but there were only a handful of people for, I would say, 15 years and the pivotal change of autism that made the difference that parents like myself said, oh my goodness, there is so much hope and there are things that we can be doing to help our kiddos. And Thomas McKeon is one of those pivotal people. Uh, he is one of the pioneers in the self-advocacy uh, platform. Um, I, I want him to tell us a lot about himself, but I do want you to know that um, he currently serves on the board of directors for the Autism Society of Ohio, and he is the author of two books, uh, One Soon Will Come the Light and the Other Light on the Horizon. Uh, he is uh, in a class of people who, uh, he was a guest on Oprah and went on Oprah with his book and says that everything that people say about having your book on Oprah is true. I can't wait to hear about that because you know I'm the biggest Oprah fan that there ever was. Uh, so Thomas McKeon, I, I'm honored that you're here and joining us right now. Welcome to Autism Live. Uh, hello, uh, good, good to be here. Uh, I'm so thrilled to have you here. And I people know I don't ever get speechless, but I, I find myself a little beclamped and a little speechless because this really is an honor for me. Uh, so thank you for, for being here. Well, I, I, usually it's Temple that makes people speechless. That, that doesn't happen to me, not often anymore anyway. Well, uh, c consider me slightly uh, gobsmacked, as they say across the pond. Uh, but I want to start, Thomas, by asking you to tell our viewers, in case there's somebody out there that's like, I don't, I don't, I've never been introduced to Mr. McKeon before. Tell us just the, the Reader's Digest version of your history and your life. And um, I mentioned a couple of things, but I'm sure there are things you'd like to add to that. 
Uh, well, there are. I, I I never know what to add one place to the next because everyone's looking for something different. I can be general. Uh, I'm 50 something years old and uh, I was diagnosed in what, 79, I think I was 14 years old. It was not all that uncommon then. And uh, back then, uh, as you read, uh, what they were doing was uh, putting kids with autism in the institutions. And I was, uh, I was in one of those for three years and I kind of had to fight my way out. And uh, there, were, there was a law in the books in the state of Ohio at the time uh, that said, if you are a minor admitted to a psychiatric facility, there is no obligation to tell you why you are there. So no one ever told me. And uh, years later, I went looking for that and I found it. And um, my involvement in advocacy, I think, was originally to, to find answers for myself. But uh, in the course of doing that, it kind of came to be a, a a cause that I really started caring about. And uh, so I'm still doing that to the extent that I can. I'm not, I'm not as active as I once was because I'm older now, but uh, you know, I, I still try to dip my toe in every now and again. I can't even imagine being a 14 year old and going into a facility like that um, and not even having an opportunity for somebody to tell you what was going on. Do you, I, I, you know, I, I can't even imagine, but I just want to applaud you for being someone who did get through that, survived, and then went on to help all of our children so that that is not their story. Well, I, I could take it a step further. Apparently, and my mother told me this just before she died, apparently they didn't tell them either. Uh, they were afraid of the A word back then. And so what they told my parents was I was developmentally delayed and they left it at that. And no one in my family knew anything until I found it. I went back to the hospital and asked for the records. Wow. And how old were you then when you first heard the word autism in conjunction with yourself? Um, uh, uh, 20, uh, 21, I think. Wow. Uh, wow. Well, you know, you, you did get yourself out of the facility and then went on to go to college, um, and went on to write two books. You've gone on to speak internationally around the world and to shed light on this subject. You, you have served the community and been on boards to make sure that the conversation included individuals who are on the autism spectrum. And, you know, as much as you say that you're not doing as much right now, I had said to you last year, you're like my favorite thing to read on Facebook. I don't know if you realize this, and a lot of people follow you on Facebook, but you you write, I think you're very prolific and you write on a regular basis. I know you have articles that are that are coming out soon that we can talk about, but um, you will introduce a topic from time to time on Facebook and the conversation sometimes gets heated, um, but I find it the most interesting thing on Facebook. You are the most interesting thing on Facebook. The, 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 the conversation does sometimes get heated. Things that should not be controversial sometimes uh, turn out to be. And maybe um, maybe when I'm, I'm posting something that I don't think is, it's because it wasn't back then. And it has since become that because in the past 30 years that I've been doing this, autism has changed in ways that I don't think anybody, anybody saw coming. No, but I, I wanted to take the time. There's so many things we could talk about with you, but today I wanted to talk with you about identity. And I guess I want to start by asking you how, how do you, I, what words do you use to identify yourself and how do you like to be identified and how much does autism play a role in that? I don't really, um, identify as a person with autism, which is not to say that I deny it, because it's definitely a part of who I am and a part of my history. 
but I don't really identify that way. We talked about this. I knew you were going to ask. So I thought what I would do is I would show you the little wall here. You can't see it. It's behind you. Over here on the far end, there's a nice little uh, amateur radio setup. And uh, for you have radio operators out there, call sign K4 X-Ray India Oscar. I am required by federal law to identify that way when I key the mic, but that's not my identity. Over here, closer, there's a, uh, a set of shelves that uh, have DVDs and Blu-rays and 4Ks in them, over 2,000 movies, most of them horrible. I have a thing for the old movies. I think I've got every one of those cheesy black and white rubber monster suit 50 sci-fi disasters ever made. And uh, I, I do like the movies, but that's not my identity. This computer that I'm talking to you on right in, right in front of you. Do you hear my phone ringing? Um, no, I don't. I use, it's, it's attached to a 55-inch monitor, my television, which is why you see the recliner behind me. And I use it mainly to write, but that's not an identity. Over here, there's a shelf matching this one. It, it's full of comics and superhero prose. In my 50 some years, I've read literally thousands and thousands of comics. And some people would say that's a wasted life. I don't see it that way because those stories were a big part of why I was able to do what I did later. But that's not my identity. And finally, over here at the end, there's a really nice acoustic guitar. Uh, that has traveled the world with me. Some of you tuning in have probably heard me play it, seen me play it. And there's a set of harmonicas, all 12 keys, a little, a couple of those little thingies so you can play both at the same time, and an award for an album I recorded back in 96. That's not an identity, but if you take all of that and put it together, that's a big part of who I am. I don't the point I'm making here is, long-winded as that is, is I don't consider myself to be just one thing. I, I don't ever want to do that because to me personally, that's kind of shallow and, and, and hollow and one-dimensional. I, I am more than that. I am more than the advocacy. I am more than the music. I'm more than the comics, the movies, the radio, the writing. I am all of that and, and more. And I think that's why you're the most interesting thing on Facebook because of what you just said, because I think that that's the space that you come from. And I know that this is problematic that, uh, and, and we just briefly touched on this in our emails back and forth, but there, there is this thing where there, there haven't been enough yet advocates that are over the age of 25 that have come forward that, um, that, parents don't still get excited at anything that I had said to you, the truth is Thomas, you could come on and tell me what you had for breakfast. And I would hang on every single word of it because your very existence and, and your intelligence and, and the spirit with which you bring to life gives me hope as an autism parent, because I have not seen three million adults on the autism spectrum. And, and so, you know, the fact that I've seen, and I probably have seen more than most parents doing this show, but, but getting to see how you manage your life and it's so different than how Temple manages her life, but they're, they're examples for me of hope. And, and yet that's a little bit of a burden, I think, for individuals on the spectrum. It, it is. And I remember early on when I was doing the conferences, I can, I think I've written about this on the airplane on my way home, looking out the window, wondering if I was doing the right thing, giving hope to parents, if it would lead to something uh, bad or not good. And um, it took me a while to figure out that that um, what I was doing was, was a good thing. And yes, it is a burden and there is responsibility there, but it's, um, it's, it's also a good thing to be able to provide. 
I love it. I, 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 I know it. that I know that not everyone is going to be me or Temple or Sean or Donna or Stephen or whoever, but I, you know, if I can come out of the institution, then you know your kids have a chance. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I and I love that um, that you don't identify uh, that that autism is not one of the words that you you know label yourself. Um, but I, I, I'm going to ask this and then you tell me if it's inappropriate because I'm sure people are going to want to know, were there areas as a kid that you struggled with that were, were hard for you and are they still hard for you or have you found a way to overcome the things that were hard then? Uh, last, last night, I listened to a, a talk you did with Temple about three months ago and uh, she, was, she was talking about math. And she was um, one of you. I think it was it was it you? Was it her? Someone? One of you was talking about how um, the, uh, one of you was mentioning. I think someone who was in college and they weren't able to finish the course, the the, the degree, because they weren't able to do the math. I think I think it was Temple. I think she was speaking specifically about algebra. Mm. And uh, that that would have been me. I don't know if she knew she was talking about me. Uh, I am like just a few credits shy of an associate's degree, and I have mm. been for years. I can write circles around anyone, but I cannot do math to save my life. So I don't have the, the college degree. As it turned out, um, I didn't need it. I found something to do, but uh, that's not going to apply to everyone. And, you know, that was also many years ago and that the, the help wasn't available then that, that there is now too. Yeah. So you struggled with math, but were there like, what, why were you put in an institution? Like, like you don't, I hope that they didn't put you in there just because you weren't good at math. What was the um, justification? Uh, well, no, it was, I, I think it was a combination of things. One thing, I think mainly it was a diagnosis. And um, that's kind of what they did back in those days, even as late as the 70s. You know, that's that's what they did. One of my goals in, in doing that work and the, and the travels was to, to try to keep kids out of the institutions. And I've actually had a lot more success with that than I ever thought I would. But it, and I think another reason was, um, you know, adolescence is a difficult time and there's like all of this stuff going on and this applies to you whether you have autism or not there's like the hormones and all these changes going on and you have to kind of navigate your way through it and i was i was feeling a little depressed and i think my parents were a little worried about that got it but but now you know we can never know what it's like to walk in somebody else's shoes but i i mean you know, I think that you're a beautiful speaker. I think that you're a beautiful writer. Um, obviously, you're an accomplished musician and you have, you know, things in your life that you're passionate about, like being on the ham radio. So to me, um, you know, you're a highly accomplished person leading your best life. We all struggle, though, all of us, we all have areas of struggle. Are there things that for you right now that you, you struggle to such an extent that you need support? Or do you live completely? Uh, if I back up, you'll see the wheels. That's that's a struggle. That's kind of uh, new. And without going into, into any additional, uh, too much detail, it's a additional neurological disorder that's kind of eating away at my muscles and my mind. I can't think as well as I used to. And mm. I've had to back out of, of doing that work that I love because of it, which kind of makes me mad. Uh, this this place is a, a basement. Um, my sister lives upstairs. It's her house. And uh, it, it, it kind of got to the point where I really, it really wasn't safe for me to live on my own anymore. So I moved in here. And all those years I was doing this, something that I noticed was siblings are very good. They are very good about their brothers and their sisters with autism. And when the parents die, 
they take them in. I have seen that time and time and time and time and time again. And I have been amazed by the love and the sacrifice. You know, she's given up a third of her house for me. I'm not paying any rent here. She just gave it to me. And that was just incredibly nice of her. Because it also means she has to put up with me now when she didn't have to do that before. But, but you know, that's that's something that I've noticed in the autism community. It's, it's brothers and sisters really do care about about family members with 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 autism. I I didn't think it would ever happen to me. I didn't think I would ever need it. But you know, I'm, I'm glad that she does too. I wouldn't want to be out on the street. Yeah. But for a lot of years, you did live independently, correct? I did. I lived in, uh, for 17 years, I lived in a small town in Virginia, Bedford, which is located uh, right between Lynchburg and Roanoke. And it was this beautiful mountain town, and you could see the Peaks of Otter, part of the uh, Blue Ridge from my backyard. And I had this little 50cc motor scooter that I used to ride up into the mountains on the last day, and I used to hang out up in the Blue Ridge. That was really nice. It was it was nice living there. And what kind of work were you doing at that point? I was doing the same thing. I was traveling. I was talking to people. I was writing. I was, uh, you know, occasionally, yeah, occasionally doing some private consulting for families and schools. I don't know if Temple's ever done this. I have spent you know, days, weeks, months in parents' homes, putting kids and families' lives back together again. I don't think there's any way I could do it now. I just don't have it up here anymore. But uh, that, that to me was the most rewarding part of the job, you know, was, was improving quality of life for others, even if it was just one person at a time. And so one of the questions I was going to ask you is that, um, you know, everybody wants to know what advice do you have? And it sounds like that for a period of time you were going in and, and being in a role that was a, a, as an advisor to families. What kinds of things when you see a family that's in pain because their child is exhibiting behaviors um, and are, are, are have, they're having a difficult time because... Autism wasn't something that they were, had any training on before their child is diagnosed. And there is, there, it seems like there's always a period of time. I certainly experienced this when my son was diagnosed was that I had to run to catch up as a parent. I can't even imagine how happy and joyous I would have been to have had somebody like you come into my home and give me a perspective. But I'm sort of wondering what kind of perspective were you giving the parents? What kinds of things did you help them with? Uh, you know, I, I looked over the medical records and the, the, the schools and, um, you know, I looked at the home life and I, you know, I went to, I went to some IEP meetings. Oh, I hated that. The schools oh, yeah. are, the schools are just not nice. Every now and again, you got some that were agreeable, but that was really the exception. And, um, you know, I just said, you know, try this, try this, try this. I give you an example. Uh, I was in, um, I think it was Auburn, Massachusetts, and there was this, uh, there's this little kid. I, I think he was around. Don't, don't take this as gospel. It's been a long time. I think he was around eight or nine years old at the time. And there were there were two particular issues that the parents were worried about. One of them was he was pushing his sister down the stairs, which I can understand why that would be an issue. That's like not something you want to do. And they had, they had this, uh, the other issue, they had this loft in the house. It was very nice. But when the, when someone went underneath it, he would, uh, how can I say it? Give them a shower. Okay. And that's, that's not good either. No. And so they said, to him, "Hey, you know, what can we do about these things?" And I spent I spent some time there, and you know, I I kind of checked it out, and I I really didn't know what to do. I was really kind of um, kind of confused. I was lying in the guest room one night, not ready to go to sleep, and this thought just came to me out of the blue. I have no idea where it came from. And the next morning I told them, I said, uh, hey, why, don't you, um, why don't you get them tested for some allergies and see what happens? And they did. And they found 
an allergy to dairy and sugar, and they cut those two things out, and the behaviors just stopped. That's amazing. Uh, absolutely amazing. And of course, you you know Dr. Doreen Grant uh, you, you go way back. We've, we've never met. I, I know of her. I think we've chatted a few times. Yeah. And she just the other day was on the show talking about eliminating milk um, from a child's diet and that sometimes that that is a thing that can show it's not for everyone, but for certain children, if they have a sensitivity um, that, you know, you can see behaviors attached to it. Uh, right. There's there's like dairy and lactose intolerance, which can lead to behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, well, I, I, again, I know, uh, we're, we're pre-recording this so people don't get a chance to ask questions live, but I know that people will want to know what advice do you have for someone of, uh, you know, whether they have a newly diagnosed three-year-old or a 14-year-old that's on the autism spectrum, what, what's like the most important thing that you want parents to know? Yeah, a lot of people have asked me that, and I do have I do have an answer to that. I'm beginning to wonder if it might be outdated. Uh, but the answer that I have given for for years, for 30 years, uh, there, there's four things that I personally recommend you do when you when you uh, when you get that diagnosis diagnosis when, you're, when your child is diagnosed. One of them is, uh, the first one is go to the library. Be careful because uh, you know, check, the, check the copyright date because if you get something too old, um, you, you may be doing more harm than good because our knowledge of this is always changing and things that we thought were right, uh, kind of we have since learned are not. Um, so kind of be careful of that and, you know, speaking to that personally, um, the, one of the, one of the books that I, that I have out there is an autobiography. Those never go out of date. The other one is kind of a how to book, which is now out of print, not officially, but it's on hiatus. I don't ever expect it to come back. It's kind of a how to book. Some of that might be a little bit outdated. So I think I have one of each. Um, the second thing is um, uh, start attending a local support group because, you know, whatever uh, issues you are having, uh, you know, there's a good possibility that someone else has already gone through that and might be able to to give you some advice on on how to handle it, and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And the whole purpose of support groups, of course, is to be supportive. That's why everyone is there. And uh, the third thing, along with that, it's very similar, would be to attend conferences. And that's whether I'm there or someone else is, because uh, you know that's where you're going to get the latest information. And the there's um, there's a networking benefit that a lot of people don't realize is there or not even aware of, even when they're doing it, and and just interacting with other parents you know, can sometimes be extremely beneficial. And then the final thing um, would be to uh, see if we could find an occupational therapist trained and certified in sensory processing disorder to look over and, and treat treat your kid. And, you know, I've always said, if you do these four things, you'll know what to do next. Like I said, that information may be a little bit outdated. I don't know. I think it's still valid. Um, I haven't really thought about it, but that's what I usually tell parents to do. There you go. I don't think it's outdated at all. I just, I think that now instead of going to the bookstore, people usually go online to look at and order books, which is what I'm going to encourage people to do right now, that I'm assuming the book that you're saying that is still in print is Soon Will Come the Light. Uh, soon Will Come the Light. And you can get it on Amazon right now, you guys. It's available. I have, I have, Amazon. I have tried like the Dickens guys to get uh, Future Horizons to ebook this. Uh, for some reason, they won't. You can only get it in print form. As long as they have the marketing rights, there's not much I can do about that. There but you, um, you know, if if you want to hear a well, sort of success story, then there it is. And I there's a lot it. of there's a lot of. Um, 
there's a lot of um, a lot of deeper information in there too. I tried to put that in, not just what is happening, but also why. And you were the winner of an Autism Society of America Literary Achievement Award. Yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't know that before either. Um, uh, and I have to say, I'm a big fan of Future Horizons. I have a book coming out from Future Horizons in July. Oh, do you? So, um, so I this was I, uh, this was their first. This book launched a publishing empire. This was Future Horizons' first book. Well, amazing, and and it was uh, you were able to tout it on Oprah. So I think probably we're all standing on your shoulders at this point. I we only have a few minutes left, and I shamelessly have to say to you, I have to ask you questions about being on Oprah because I am like like the biggest fan of Oprah. What what was that like for you to go on Oprah? Was that a sensory overwhelming thing, or was it um, as cool as I think it, it was? Might it be? was a little disappointing and not because of Oprah. She had nothing to do with that, but because of 9-11. Between the time they scheduled um, the show and the time that it was supposed to be recorded, 9-11 ha happened, and that threw everything off. And so what happened, what ended up happening was a producer and a camera man flew out to Virginia and interviewed me there and i never got to meet her ah. but you know i the, the way i i'm choosing to to uh to look at that is if the worst thing that happened to me because of 9 11 is i didn't get to meet oprah i still came out ahead of it better than a lot of people did well maybe oprah will see this and see that they need to you know from time to time they do the the show on the own network now where are they now i i want to encourage oprah to catch up with you now and see where you are now uh and replay that interview because um i i, I gotta be honest with you i didn't get to see that i watched oprah religiously um, and I couldn't never understand why I never saw the interview. And because it was right around 9-11, that is why I didn't see it. So Oprah, if you're watching, and let's face it, she's not, but somebody who knows Oprah, please get her to watch it, right? Uh, and catch up with Thomas again, because we'd all like to see that interview again. Uh, Thomas, I just, I can't even tell you um, what this has meant to me, Um I, I've been doing this show for 10 years and I don't really understand why we haven't had you on before, but I'm glad that it's worked out and that you came on and I'd love to invite you to come back. And there are so many more topics that we want to talk about with you. And there are some things that I think you just have one of the most refreshing outlooks on, on some of the more controversial topics that are, that are happening right now, talking about neurodiversity, talking about therapies, um, I, I find your point of view to be so enlightening. Well, uh, uh, guys out there listening, uh, I, I guess if you want, you could click follow on the page. Um, can, can they see that little uh, Thomas A. McKean down there they at the bottom? They absolutely can. And we can tell them where to follow you. Tell tell us all your social media and we'll tell them to follow Just you. one because I, I tried doing more than one and it just got too complicated. So I'm in one place, uh, one place only, and that would be Facebook. Uh, Thomas A. McKean, all one word, no period after the A. So it would be uh, Facebook dot com thomas a mckean or you could do a search for thomas a dot uh mckean and i should i should turn up uh so if you want to if you want to click follow guys if you want to follow me you're welcome to shannon's right i do um i do post about these things and uh i i really um enjoy hearing the 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 various uh, the various views and the various perceptions and comments on it, you know, it's uh, not everyone feels the same about everything, and uh, you know, for me, that's really kind of okay because there's so much about this that we just don't know, and I can't prove or guarantee that I'm right, and I could be wrong, and and someone that I don't agree with may be right, because we just don't know. 
you know, my, my guess is a little educated, but it's still just a guess on a lot of these things. So, you know, we, we talk about, uh, we talk about the, the, the topics there. There's a lot of other parents and, and people with autism uh, on the page too, who kind of, who kind of chime in from time to time. So guys, if you, if you want to follow me, you're welcome to do that. And I love, it's very respectful discussion, but you're right. It's like everybody's opinion shows up and flourishes and nobody is put down for their opinion. Um, but I think that you always have this voice of reason that bubbles up and over all of it and makes me happy and thrilled. Um, I just, I, I just always, I always learn something. The other thing that you do is you give little mini history lessons. Because well, yeah, because I was there. Yeah, but there, but there are things that, uh, you know, when 9-11 happened, I was not the parent of a child on the autism spectrum. So even if I had seen your Oprah interview, I don't think it would have impacted me like it would now because I would have been like, well, isn't that interesting? But it wouldn't have been personal to me. And, you know, so there were things that happened among different autism organizations that I'm unaware of and you will shed light on it. And I go, oh, well, that makes sense. That's how that happened. Right. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, I've, but, I've talked about things like that. I've, I've talked about things like the creation of the puzzle piece in Autism Awareness Month, because I was a part of both of those. And uh, I, I think that as far as, um, as, as posting those things and, and having, you know, that, that point of view that you're talking about, one of the things that I think is required to be a good advocate is to be able to see this from all different points of view. Ruth Sullivan walked up to me once and she told me, <laughs> she accused me of not having theory of mind. Ooh. Now I'm thinking I may have said or done something in the ASA boardroom that kind of made her think that way because she was there. But uh, you you have to, if you if you want to be a good advocate, if you want to be effective, you have to be able to see the problem, not just from the side of the person with autism, but also from the perspective of the parent, the doctor, the therapist, the educator, and even the legislator, and and not and and even if you're looking at it from the from the from the perspective of the person of autism, you have to change that a little bit because it's not your style or your type or your brand; it's theirs that you have to look at it through, and and. One of the reasons that I've had whatever success I have, I think, is just because I've been able to kind of look at this from all different areas and through that find solutions. And, yeah. and um, you know, when I when I when I write those things that you're talking about, that's one of the things that I try to do is I try to I try to to write it through the perspective of of more than one place. And I think I think people appreciate that. Well, I have so much respect for Ruth Sullivan and for all the work that she did in her life, but I'm going to say it here. She was wrong. And all oh, you have to do you. is read one thing that you write to see that you probably are one of the best perspective takers uh, that I've ever had the opportunity to read their, their writings. So unfortunately, Ruth, I, you know, I know Ruth is in heaven now, but Ruth, you were wrong about <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> I, I, I also have a I also have a great respect for the work that she has done, and I think I told her that at some point too. I was I <laughs> was, was able was to I was able, I was able to say that right to her, and I'm I'm glad I was able to do that before she died. Oh, Thomas, I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to do this, and of course, we we want to welcome you to come back at another time, and we'll pick more topics, and we'll do it. If you're comfortable, we'll do it when we're live, and then you'll be able to talk to the audience at large, and I think they will really enjoy that. We we didn't really uh, get in, I think, to what we had planned to, yeah. and uh, I do have a lot to say about that particular topic, as you know. So yes. I would uh, I'd be happy to come back and get into All a little right. deeper discussion about ideas if you would like. I would love that. I mean, just what you said, just I think it uh, brightened all of our days uh, to be more accepting of ourselves and more accepting of other people and not try to shove them into little cubby holes. Uh, you can't do that. You, that you, you can't. You're, you, well, you can, but you're not going to get anywhere. 
Exactly. Exactly. So again, um, people should check you out on Facebook. And I think if you just read for one week, the things that uh, Thomas writes, you'll be hooked. Oh, uh, look, somebody found me. Somebody, do you see well, that? Somebody found our, me. I, that's I our think producer. that's it. Yeah, I yeah think, that's it. I think that's the link. Put it there. So yeah, now you guys know how to get there and uh, we'll look forward to having Thomas. And I will send you any questions that they, that they send in uh, as well, Thomas. So if you have something you want to ask Thomas, go ahead, send it in and I'll send it over to him. But uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, but I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Well, it was a, it was a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. I hope that everybody has a wonderful Martin Luther King Day. And we are back tomorrow with Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grampiche will be here tomorrow to answer your questions live on the show. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.